Now that we've completed our discussions of the immune system, we're now ready to move into the part of the semester where we're going to be discussing different types of diseases of the body. In your textbook, your diseases are separated by the part of your body that is majorly affected by that disease. This week we're going to start with chapters 21 and 22 where we'll be looking at the diseases of the skin and eyes in chapter 21 and then diseases of the nervous system in chapter 22. As we move into chapter 21 and we look at the diseases of the skin, we need to first think about what type of microbe is going to be living on the skin. As we discussed back in chapter 14, the skin itself is a very intact area. It is difficult for the microbe to move directly through your skin. Therefore, we're going to rely on a parenteral route, meaning a cut or artificial break in the skin, to allow most microbes to enter through your skin. Alternatively, we will see some of these diseases are caused by an infection of the microbe moving down possibly into hair follicles or maybe some other means going directly into the eye or, or something of that nature. We've also previously discussed that the skin itself is very dry. It is very acidic. So it is not a good environment for most microbes to live on. We're going to see a lot of the infections of the skin coming from the normal microbiota of the skin moving into other places such as hair follicles or deeper into the layers of the skin. The three most common groups of microbes we normally see on the skin are going to be our gram-positive cocci. Some common gram-positive cocci are Staphylococcus. This would include Staphylococcus epidermis, Staphylococcus aureus, many, many more. Also, Micrococcus luteus, um, Streptococcus. There are just many different types of cocci. There are going to be the diphtheroids. The most common in this group will be the Propionibacterium acnes, which you could probably guess the causative agent of acne. And then our third group are going to be our yeast. Main yeast we're going to see is Candida albicans, but there will be many more as we go throughout. The diseases of the skin are going to mainly demonstrate signs that include one of these five listed here. The diseases of the skin will typically have vesicles, which are going to be small fluid fill, fluid filled bumps on the skin. So this picture here is showing you a vesicle. Something like a pimple is going to be a vesicle. If the vesicle gets much larger, something like this picture here, then we would call it a boule. This is going to be what we think of as um, a typical staph infection or a boil is sometimes what this is called. Sometimes your signs of your skin infection do not have any fluid on them. And then we will call it a macule, which could look like this picture here. Possibly a papule, which gets a little bit bigger. Or if the papule has a liquid pus center underneath the epidermis, then we will call it a pustule. So we'll see these different types as we go through. The most common infection we see on the skin caused by bacteria is caused by the bacteria genus Staphylococcus. Most of the time, Staphylococcus is present on the external portions of our skin, and it does not cause any harm to us. However, when these, air, when these bacteria move deeper into our skin, then we can see infections. Staphylococcus epidermis is one of the least likely to cause infections, and that is only going to happen if your skin is broken in a large area. Staphylococcus aureus, however, we do see more commonly causing infections. These infections can be very minor or they can get fairly involved depending on the specific strain of the Staphylococcus aureus that is infecting the body. Something very simple, if Staphylococcus aureus moves down into a hair follicle, this can cause a pimple. If Staph aureus moves into an eyelash follicle, we can get a sty. Or if staph moves further down into the dermis, we can get a boil or possibly even an abscess if it gets much deeper and more infected. Okay. There are some 
more traditional infections we see caused by Staphylococcus, and we give these diseases names. A very common disease which many of you would be familiar with is Impetigo. Impetigo is a very infectious staph infection that we see on the superficial surfaces of mainly children's faces. Once one child comes in contact with a strain of staph that leads to impetigo, all it takes is direct contact with that one child, and then you can end up with impetigo. The common sign of impetigo is going to be these what we call honey-colored crusty sores that appear around the oral mucosa. Some people would look at this picture and say that this looks like a fever blister or you know, some sort of herpes type infection. But how this is going to look different is you're not going to have any fluid associated with this. It's going to have the honey color, and it's going to move further down the face away from the oral mucosa instead of just directly underneath. A fever blister is going to be more closely in the area of the lips themselves. In very young children with underdeveloped immune systems, we can see impetigo move to a more systemic disorder, reminding you systemic means throughout the bloodstream. Then we no longer call it impetigo. We call it scald skin syndrome. Scald skin syndrome happens when the Staphylococcus aureus is traveling through the child's bloodstream and then begins to produce a toxin. The toxin produced by the Staphylococcus aureus is an endotoxin. The endotoxin then causes the separation of skin that we see, which makes the baby look like almost like they've been dipped into boiling water, and the exterior layers of the skin are, being, are peeling off. Sometimes you'll see this called desquamation of the skin. This is very similar to what we see with toxic shock syndrome which is associated with improper uses of tampons in older adults. We do not see it all over the body. Instead, it's just going to be localized to the vagina. We can also have infections not just of the staphylococcus on our skin, but involving the streptococcus on our skin. We can have just a streptococcus infection that goes down into the dermis leads to this darkening where you have blood pooling underneath the dermis. Or we can have what we call the flesh-eating bacteria. Flesh-eating bacteria is caused by a very virulent or active, highly damaging strain of streptococcus. Flesh-eating bacteria happens when the streptococcus is growing extremely fast and causing tons of damage to the area. What's going on in this picture down here, this is what it looks like after someone has presented to a hospital with necrotizing fasciitis, or the flesh-eating bacteria. They have gone in and surgically removed the area that is infected with the streptococcus. That is the only way to get rid of it. Most of the time when we see these sorts of infections, the bacteria itself is antibiotic resistant. So just giving antibiotics is not going to kill the bacteria. They have to remove the skin and hope for the best. Moving to something a little different, there are some other bacteria that commonly infect the skin, and we call these pseudomonads. Pseudomonads are gram-negative rods that we commonly find in places such as swimming pools, hot tubs, and even in your soap dish in your shower. If the pseudomonas gets on your skin, it typically doesn't do anything to someone that is not immunocompromised. But to anyone, if the pseudomonas, mainly pseudomonas aeruginosa, moves into the ear, we call this otis externa, or more commonly, swimmer's ear. This is a lot of times what happens to people in the summertime when they've been doing a lot of swimming, getting in pools and different things like that on a regular basis. They get swimmer's ear. It's an infection of this bacteria in the ear. Pseudomonas is also very commonly an infection we see with burn victims. It will occur on the skin of the burn victim, and you get kind of a bluish green color to the outside of the burn. This bacteria itself blow, grows in a bluish green color. 
Acne is one of the most common diseases. About 17 million people in the United States every year are affected by acne. Acne occurs as bacteria that are commonly on the outside of the epidermis move deeper into hair follicles, combine with oil, and then clog that hair follicle. Okay. We usually think of this as what we call a whitehead. When you see that white head on the surface of a pimple, this is the bacteria itself growing down in the pimple. A lot of times we like to think when we see a black head, that means that we need to get that black spot out of the pimple. The black head is just a chemical reaction that's occurring by the bacteria down in the hair follicle. A lot of times the ability for this bacteria to move down into our skin and cause acne is related to hormonal changes in the body. Not whether or not we clean our face enough or whether or not we've eaten too much chocolate. There are many different types of acne and we could spend all day talking about this. But the main thing I wanted you to take away from it is when you have true acne, that's not just a pimple that occurs every now and then. True acne is going to cover large regions of the body. It is truly a disease caused by a bacterial infection. And you're typically going to have to have some sort of antibiotic to, to cure the infection. That's all for the bacterial infections of the skin. Now we move into viral infections of the skin. One of the most common viral infections we see on the skin is caused by papillomaviruses. Papillomaviruses lead to warts. Warts are spread by direct contact with an individual that is carrying the papillomavirus. You do not have to come in contact with someone's actual wart to get a papillomavirus. Most of the population already carries papillomaviruses, but for some reason that cannot be explained, some people's immune system keeps the papillomavirus from erupting into a wart, and some people do not have that ability. There are many different types of warts, and that's more for a nursing class or, or you know, more in-depth class where we're looking at specific diseases. Another viral disease that's caused, that has an effect on the skin is smallpox. Smallpox, as we will see with all of our pox infections, are spread by a respiratory route. All you have to do is be around the person carrying the smallpox and you can inhale the virus yourself. Smallpox is a very deadly disease and because of its high mortality rate, we have now produced vaccinations and we have eradicated smallpox worldwide. The last known natural case of infection with smallpox in the, in the world, in the civilized world, was in 1977. Therefore, we do not vaccinate against smallpox currently. However, this disease is really highly studied even to this day because this is what we believe is one of the most likely diseases that would be used in a bio.